you're doing well. Um, I'm Erica. I'm Dr. Erica Barron, and this is our head LVT, Ellen Carosa, here at Nova Cat Clinic. And today, we're going to show you, using this really cute stuffed animal, how we monitor cats under anesthesia. Because we always have questions about, like, oh, what do you actually do? Like, what is, why is the dental so much more than when I have a dental when I go to the dentist? Yeah. Well, because they're under anesthesia, and anesthesia, it has a lot of risks, which can be avoided or minimized if we do proper monitoring. So that's why we do monitoring. But Ellen, quick question, because this is on every anesthesia, everything I've ever done. What is the most important part of monitoring anesthesia? Me. Her. She wins. <laughs> Me. It's always a person. All of the tools tell you what's going on, but the person has to know right. something's wrong. So that's part of the reason anesthesia is yep. so expensive because yep. we need so many people staring at the cat and the machines. Right? And, and the, the machines beats. only complement what we can do. Um, of course, our number one tool we always use under anesthesia is a stethoscope, but the pieces of equipment we're going to show you today actually help us determine if we're starting to have an anesthetic adverse event earlier so Which we, we can need to prevent work on. it. Yes. Um, and plus, we can also see the trends of the animal and how well they do under anesthesia. Do we run into any problems? Um, are there any underlying problems that, on a physical exam, the doctors can't see? But we sure can find it under anesthesia a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, some cats will actually find out that they do have heart issues under anesthesia, even though they sound perfectly normal on an exam. So we're going to go over a bunch of equipment that we technically use with every single procedure that we do when they're sedated. Or anesthetized. Yes, we do a lot of things. Sophie, is there a question? I can't see that far. I just saw something blink. Laura Lee says, hello, some of my favorite people. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> so nice to see you too. Okay, so let's start. So first, we sedate the cat. We give it an injection. Injection. Okay. Then sometimes they throw up. Okay, that's done. <laughs> we, try, we don't want them to, but sometimes it happens. Um, then we go ahead and we put in an IV catheter. Um, we usually use the inside of the back leg because then we don't have to shave as much on the front and the cats don't go after it. And then it's we more aesthetically pleasing too to a lot of our clients is one of the reasons why we got into the habit of that. Also, if that cat needs a long term indwelling catheter, those front legs are your best friends. So if we're doing a very short term procedure just for like maybe a couple hours or so, that back leg is perfectly acceptable. And it also shows off that you have mad skill if you can place one. I can't always do it. I have some days I can and some days I can't because I used to do a lot of dogs. So I'm good at the front leg, and that's my friend. But if you have mad skill, you can do the back leg on almost every cat. I have some skill, not mad skill. So anyway, we sedate them. Do 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 if they have an IV catheter. And the reason we put in an IV catheter is because besides for the technician, that is monitoring the pet under anesthesia and the stethoscope and all the tools, the catheter is the gateway to the patient. So if something does start to happen, it's imperative that our patients, when they're under general anesthesia, that they have a catheter or if they're a critical pet. Yep. Um, because if there's a small change, we need to jump on it fast. And that we don't have time when you're under anesthesia to go back and place a catheter. We have to do it before you're completely knocked out. Right. Plus um, it also helps that we put the, your pet on IV fluids during their procedure, which helps keep them hydrated because they have been fasting for several hours. Mm -hmm. It also helps keep their blood pressure up mm -hmm. because when you are under anesthesia or you are sedated, your blood pressure is going to be compromised from the pharmaceuticals that are used. So we want to make sure that the body can keep up that blood pressure and actually process those drugs properly too. It's actually going to flush your system out. Yes, it's important. Okay, so IV catheter is placed. We put an E-tube down your throat. We're not going to show that because it's not going to fit on this guy. It's like bigger than him or her. I don't want to say it's a him or her. It's the cat. I feel like he needs a name. Do you want to name him? I just it's Brevecto cat. Brevecto cat. <laughs> Brevecto is great. We won't talk about that today, but it's great. Let's call him Bob. Okay, so Bob then has the E-tube put down. That's how we breathe for them. We inflate it. We do whatever we need to do before surgery once he's hooked into the gas machine. So um, let's say it is, let's say it's a foreign body procedure because those are fun for me, not for the cat, for me. 
Um, so then we're going to prep him here. Do, 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 do. While he's being prepped, Ellen, what's the next step? Well, honestly, while he's being prepped, before he's even prepped, this cat when is hooked up flip to him over, everything. So we he flip gets him over and then we go. He's literally being prepped for surgery. We're done with the IV catheter. He's now on his back. He's on, He has a tube in. Right, he has a tube in. But what we're going to do now is we're going to hook him up to oxygen and we are going to, first thing we are going to attach that, um, the anesthesia machine, it's, um, this is our capnographer, and we like to call her Emma, because that's what her name actually is. That's what it says on the machine. We don't just call things Emma. And this actually checks the cat's end tidal CO2, which helps determine their ventilation. Um, it lets us know that they are actually moving enough oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out of their body, and plus it also counts the respiration for us, even though we will still visually do it and listen to your cat's lungs under anesthesia. This can give us an indication by the numbers if this cat is starting to get too deep under anesthesia or the cat is starting to become a little too light under anesthesia. So it helps us determine whether or not with the depth of anesthesia by the end tidal CO2. So that gets hooked up immediately to your pet. Now they're on oxygen, they're on gas. Next thing that starts to get hooked up to them is our ECG monitor that also has a pulse oximeter on it. And what does ECG do? ECG tells me the electric current of your heart and if it's appropriate. There is a, a, a specific way it's supposed to look when it's under anesthesia because there's a specific line through the heart where the beats are supposed to go. So the looked up is a, a certain way it's supposed to happen. If that is abnormal, if it's taking too long in the luck, if it's taking too long in the duck, if it's going duck luck, or if the... If the um, current is going the opposite way, which can happen, um, then we can see it, and then we can do something about it. Right. It's very important for us to see this, because even though it's not common for there to be an issue, there is an issue we need to know, and we need to know what to do. Also, sometimes when cats and dogs, mo more dogs, start to go under anesthesia, I know we're talking about cats, but it's worth it just to say, um, they can have different, not just the way the ECG is supposed to look, but there's also a rhythm to it. And if the rhythm is abnormal, that's important to see as well. Um, so that gives us a lot of information about what we can do because some of the, sedati the sedatives can give you an arrhythmia or drop your blood pressure or do a lot of different things. So if that's happening, we need to know so that we can fix it before it becomes detrimental to the pet. Right, and it also gives us an early indication is if are you going getting ready to go into cardiopulmonary arrest? Mm -hmm. We can catch that earlier on these devices than we can a lot of times listening to the patient because they may sound perfectly normal 20 seconds ago and all of a sudden the screen on this machine starts not looking correct. We can catch everything early and start treating appropriately before we have a disastrous event starting to occur. And then the nice thing about this little gizmo, it also has a pulse oximeter on it. And these little guys basically do this, basically, you know, checks your heart rate and it also yeah. does your oxygen saturation rate to make sure that do we have enough oxygen going to you? You better be at 100% the entire time. Well, not 100%, but you need to be in the high 90s. Oh, no, I'm stick with those cats better be at 100%. No, they can't. They're not always at 100%. <laughs> no, they're not. Happen. But I like they them never have really happens. high on their um, O2 saturation Also, if rate. they are at 100%, that can mean something else is going on. Let's not go there right now. This is the same, the pulse ox is the same thing that happens when you go to the ER and you're having an issue breathing, the, the same thing they stick on your finger. Um, in cats, we stick it on their toes. Or their ear, or their tongue, anywhere that's pink. Black beans tend to have a little bit more of an issue, so we tend to use their tongue with their ears. Um, this piece of equipment is the same thing. It's just simply a pulse oximeter, that is it, versus the smaller gizmo. It we can see the, the waves and everything from the electrocardiogram, etc. I can't see this far. further today, so I can't see. Thanks, Steve just came. Hi, Steve. <laughs> then on top of that, while we have that going, we're also hooking up your cat's blood pressure monitor. And blood pressure is just equally as important under anesthesia because, well, this is the pressure of the blood against the vessel walls. Um, it can go too high. It can go too low. Um, it could also be an indication that we're starting to have a problem as well especially if we already have a patient that already has compromised blood pressure before going under anesthesia. You might have a nor normal rhythm, but if your blood pressure is dropping, there's 
there, there's a lot. The reason we need more than one machine telling us all these different things is so we can monitor effectively because all of these machines give us different information that helps us decide which drugs or which, um, uh, if we need to turn the gas down, if we need to give you some type of drug to offset what's going on, if you're too light, if you're too low. There's a lot of different things, and these all give us informa- different types of information to help us choose what to do next. That's why it's all so important. Um, okay, so that's all stuck in. Cat's ready to go this is have a form important. body. Wait, this is just as important. You have to have the temperature checked. Yeah, we do that While too. they monitored too. This is just as important. It is. And then they go, and they're in anesthesia, and everybody's staring at them. It's fun. It's fun to do it. It's, it's, it's important to make sure that they're monitored correctly because they're members of the family and they should be treated as such. Right, and then everything is put down on a flow sheet and we can document your pet's trends the entire time where we started having any problems occurring or if they've been a smooth sailing anesthesia the entire way. So and this that's is important because not only is that important for this anesthesia, but if they ever need to have anesthesia in the future, then we can see, oh wait, this one's a little bit sensitive to opioids. We might not want to give that drug. Or wait, this one went a little bit low. Why don't we pre-treat with glycopyrrolate or something? So there's different, everybody's an individual, so we need to treat as such, and that's why it's important to have that in the medical record so we know what to do in the future. It's the same thing like, you know, I can't have Sudafed. It knocks me out. I know it says it's not drowsy, but it knocks me out. But I know that, and my doctors know that, so we, I don't get that. Same idea. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for us? Because this cat had a very successful anesthetic procedure. Oh, you know what we should say? What are the two most um, important, well, the whole thing's important to monitor, but what are the two most um, important times to monitor closely because that is when a pet or person is most likely to have a complication? Anybody there? Anybody know? at the beginning, at induction, and during recovery. So that's why we stare at them all day. Mm-hmm. Like, we're still staring at our patients from earlier. Yep. That's why someone needs to be dedicated monitor for the pet the entire day. Um, it is very common to have a post-operative anesthetic death because someone's not paying attention to the oxygen saturation of the patient if they are not... Um, awake enough or they're not reversed or they're not metabolizing their drugs properly that can be a big issue their temperature can get too low that can be a big issue so all of these complications can play a role into a successful you know post anesthetic recovery we want to make sure that your patient um, that we have that day they wake up within 20 minutes of their procedure comfortably There are some patients that will take a lot longer to recover because we want them to take a longer recovery due to the type of surgery we performed, um, especially if we want them to recover really slowly from a gastroenterotomy or an amputation or whatever because we want them to recover slowly because we don't want them to hurt themselves. Um, So there's different um, sets of on, on how you can recover your patient, but effectively waking them up at a nice steady rate and paying attention to them the entire time is vitally important for them. So oh, they, our patients don't get to go home minimum of three hours after their procedure. Um, when they're here, they're, they might be up, they might be eating. Um, they required, you will stay with me for three hours to make sure I don't run into any complications post-operatively that a doctor needs to address. Yeah, my daughter had a tonsillectomy two and a half weeks ago, and the surgeons, um, well, the nurses stared at her for two hours. I had to watch some really dumb shows on Disney. It was so dumb. So Um, you said we had a question? Yes. What is the most common complication post anesthesia when you bring your pet home from the procedure? Is it URI common after intubation? Oh, an upper respiratory infection? It sure can be a complication. But it's not reason reason why. why. (laughs) Um, Your pets can have an upper respiratory post um, anesthesia because of it could be from stress. Um, a lot of times we see cats um, break out with a herpes flare-up. It's pretty common. It was a stressful event. Um, some cats may have an underlying upper respiratory as it is, and we go and we intubate them, 
and we hear that you know their lungs don't sound as great suddenly or when we extubate them there's a big glob of boogers on the end of it well something's been going on and now that now that we've stuck a tube down there we stress them out and now we've aggravated it or a worst case scenario is that that endotracheal tube that was used on that patient wasn't clean or brand new beforehand. We clean ours. And yeah, we th- uh, ours are uh, very, very clean. Um, but in the worst case I scenario, it's it, it it can happen. Worst case scenario, they're given a tube that hasn't been cleaned properly, and now you've just passed germs back and forth through each other. But the most common effect is I get a herpes flare up right yes. after surgery. You know, yes. I'm a cat. You know, you just brought me into the office, yes. and now I'm going to have an upper respiratory infection. Because remember, all cats have herpes. It's just how it is. And during times of stress, their herpes comes on as, like, walking around like this and having a gunky eye yep. or upper respiratory sneezing. So it's a, a viral I- issue, and then it can open the gateway for a secondary yep. infection. Also, cats are a species of prey, and, um, of prey and predation. They are the masters at hiding everything from us. So it's not unlikely for a cat to come in that we all think is perfect. Is blood work looks perfect. It sounds perfect. Everything is perfect. And then the next day after a procedure, which should have been, you know, was routine, there was no issue, they come in and something else is going on. Um, it just happens because that's, that's the nature of the beast or the nature of the cat. Uh, one of the things we were saying earlier with complications, I had a dog I worked on um, a while ago, and when she woke up from anesthesia, she was fine, but she was a bulldog. And about an hour after she had woken up and she had been fine under anesthesia, she was fine at extubation, everything was okay, she just had a really hard time breathing. We actually had to sedate her and reintubate her, and she had to stay intubated and go to the ER for about two days to help her clear a pneumonia that just occurred. She didn't have pneumonia before. Sometimes it can happen. It's usually in bulldogs. Um, And luckily she was okay. Um, But, you know, that's why you have to stare. That's why the patients are stared at for so long. Because if something bad happens, we need to act fast. You, You don't act slow with anesthesia. You don't just sit there and wait and not act when you see something's going on. Yeah, you don't wait for a problem to occur. No. <laughs> Sophie, it looks like there's a couple comments. I can't see that far. At what point do you remove the catheter after the procedure? Once they are... Now, now it all depends. Now, if I have a patient that has had complications post-operatively, you bet you that IV catheter is probably going to stay in until or they're getting ready to go Or if it's a home. critical patient, or if it's a patient that has like a long-term issue that we're just like, eh. So that'll stay in, like, until I'm almost finished. the end of the day. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I make the magic happen. You be a doctor. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but normally, usually when the patient is sitting up They've been extubated. They look comfortable removing the IV catheter at that point in time so they can finish recovering. Because you have to remember, some of our patients that we get are a little fiery and spicy. And so removing them from the cat kennel again can cause further issues. But we make sure that it's usually within a half an hour of them recovering that that IV catheter gets to come on out. Unless they are a critical patient, someone who's been under surgery for quite a long time, or a cardiac patient that we don't want to take any chances with. We're going to leave that catheter in until the very last moment. Any other questions, Sophie? Uh, Laura Lee says, would you please move your clinic to the Seattle area? <laughs> there are cat clinics out there. Unfortunately, we can't go Seattle. out there. Sorry. Um, but there's a whole bunch of feline hospitals out there, and you can go to AAFP online um, or Cat Vets, and you can look um, basically you can up any search, feline animal You can search there. by zip code, I think, on there. Yep, and you can find it either a feline-friendly hospital, do your research, make sure it truly is a feline-friendly hospital, or look up ones that are feline-specific only. She says, but I love you guys. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's nice. Um, okay, so I don't, I don't think we have anything else we need to say about this, do you? No, it's just, you know, it's a daily routine for us. It is, it happens from every single patient, no matter if you are a rescue cat or you are a client, you are going to get the same common courtesy when it comes to anesthetic monitoring and care 
um, that every cat truly deserves, and we really do believe that here at the clinic. Well, because our patients are our family members, and we treat all the family members how we would want all of our family members yep. treated. And our point is just to give cats more birthdays. Yep. More birthdays. Yes. We had cake today. It was pretty good. Yeah, it looked good. <laughs> there were also cookies down there. I had one of those, too. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, okay, well, um, thanks for your help, Bob. I thought he was helpful. Um, if anybody ever has any questions about um, any anesthetic procedures here or what our protocols are, you can contact us online. Um, you can contact us on Facebook. You can email the clinic. That's office at novacatclinic.com. Thanks for spending this time with us, and, and we appreciate all the comments we, we've been getting. And if you have any things you would like us to chat about, we try to do this about once a week. It just depends on our schedules. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. The cats here come first. So whatever we can do to help you, just let us know. Thanks, and have a great Wednesday. Bye. Bye.